Welcome to A Thrivable Life, a podcast that shows how ordinary people can take everyday actions for a thrivable future where everyone lives in harmony with nature. Hi, I'm Kavya, a project manager by profession, and I've lived and worked in Asia, Africa, Australia, and I currently live in the Solomon Islands. I'm always curious to learn about educational practices. And I'm Mike. I'm a research assistant at Thrive with a background in political science and social policy. I also have a passion for sustainability. And we are from the Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research institute, think tank, and the advocacy group. Before we introduce this week's guest, we would like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia, as well as First Nations people across the globe. We would like to introduce today's guest, Emmanuel. Emmanuel is a Ghanaian national who has lived in in Ghana, Togo and Nigeria in West Africa. He has a Bachelor of Business Administration and Masters in ICT Education. He is passionate about sustainability and believes that education can be a great way to empower communities and foster positive change. Emmanuel's combination of academic expertise, cultural awareness, and his dedication to leveraging education for community empowerment reflects a broader vision for a more inclusive and sustainable future in West Africa and beyond. Hi, Emmanuel. Uh, Thanks for joining us. Hello. Happy to be here. Thanks, Emmanuel. Hi, Michael. Yeah, hi, Kavi. Hi, Emmanuel. Today, I think we could talk a little bit today about education. I know, Emmanuel, this is connected to your background and expertise as well. Um, maybe we could start from the perspective of how we look at education. Uh, so, Michael, maybe it might be worth trying to explain broadly how we define education or the objectives of education and then understand from Emmanuel practically how it's probably viewed in a broader African context. Yeah, sure. I think when we look at, obviously, uh, globally, um, oh, one of the United Nations SDGs is access to quality education. And obviously, this has been a a significant part of, I would say, the Western world. If we, you know, obviously, obviously have origins which influence uh, things today, based in uh, ancient Greece, and a lot of that was, um, you know, different philosophical approaches, uh, epistemological approaches to the way in which we understand the world and uh, uh, the way in which knowledge is gained. And so, obviously, that um, has a huge backdrop to uh western world in general but uh, the world you know more, more broadly but obviously it has its origins in a western context uh, in ancient greece and we can see that um that there's obviously been different different approaches taken from you know philosophical um understandings to, to understanding out the world around us through our senses through empirical and you know reason-based uh understandings and obviously that's filtered into different uh, approaches linked to technological advancements over the centuries and, and or millennia, really, and uh, different approaches through physics. You know, we see that with you know things like engineering. We see it in medicine. We see it in um, you know just uh, other natural sciences and even you know aspects of say psychology and then sociology and the different uh, humanities sort of approaches. So, I suppose um, in a nutshell, we would probably define yeah education as trying to expand or enhance an individual's capacity to have a greater impact regarding a practical usage of, of skills through through um, through different uh, disciplines uh, where they have an actual measurable impact, uh, where te- technology is the case. Like, you know, just say, you know, engineers, you, you know, knowing how to build bridges over, over rivers, for example, and, you know, the way in which this has enabled civilization and, you know, humanity to, to sort of... Uh, evolve within that context but there's also that the other aspects or epistemological approaches which are linked to um sort of refining uh sort of our social interactions and and laws that get created and and the sort of uh, political systems that we have you know even democracy and 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 approaches like that and all, all of these obviously are linked to different um different disciplines and refining these and obviously the impact is the world as we know it and there are obviously shortcomings with educational processes but also many benefits and i think within the west and the developing world in general it's probably it's, it's such an important focus to look at and there are obviously particular or very specific issues within the western context in the western developed world for wealthier countries but also there are other uh, issues for that uh, the developing world and say many countries within africa may uh, currently face so uh, I think it's yeah important to look at uh, across the board. To summarize, I think you mentioned that the objective is to broaden the horizon and understanding of kind of the world around us and the progress of things in general has been the objective of education. 
Emmanuel, how would you think is education is perceived broadly in this context? Thank you, Kabia. The idea of education would not differ or does not differ so much uh, in the African context because the pursuit of knowledge for uh, economic development, personal development, or societal development is similar to the Western world. The only difference is that because we kind of, uh, you know, in the context of modern education, we uh, we were a bit behind because most of the development have been made in Western countries, uh, at least uh, with ideas that have been propounded or have been developed based by Western uh, philosophers, Western uh, scientists, Western uh, physicists, or others. Years before we like this concept were passed into or were introduced into our society here in Africa, but uh, you would you would also think that uh, it should be great because uh, if uh, a lot of developmental problems that uh, Africa will make or is supposed to make should not depend on training it uh, human resource, you know, because with brighter mind can brighter future and a more or, or a better advancement of economic and social. Uh, uh, development that we can make in our country. So education does not really differ much, uh, except that uh, it has not been primarily uh, facilitated by the uh, the desire to you know uh, know how how the world works, unlike how it began in uh, Western cultures. You know, I mean, currently you would think of education as just acquisition of skills to, to become very important in the world. But if you look at the philosophers or scientists that began uh, the uh, uh, adventure into knowing how the world works, but in this current kind of setting, we're looking out more how to uh, understand the world around us and uh, you know, be able to develop the things that we currently see, uh, being it social, societal, being it uh, technological, being it infrastructural, or even uh, political or religious uh, systems that are around us. Yeah, that, that's actually very interesting. And uh, um... I've actually grown up and studied in India. And one of the things that happened in India as well, that given that economic growth was so important at the time that I, I was growing up, especially uh, the pursuit of education was not for, you know, for the sake of education or for the sake of just you know, uh, expansion of mind. It was specifically, like Emmanuel mentioned, a lot to do with economic uh, requirements as well. So studying languages, studying history, studying, you know, philosophy are not necessarily things that was considered uh, something that a smart person would, would take up. Uh, you would take them up only if you were unable to kind of get marks for something that would give you skills that are extremely in demand, like, you know, your engineering, medicine, and law and others. Um, so I, I do get somewhere, I think, in between that even though we pursue and study different activities, but they're not as important in that context. Um, yeah, so that's that's very interesting to see how uh, this is, I guess, differed. Uh, and I think just to talk about the different philosophies of education, it, it education has been across millennia in our, I think, uh, society, but in different forms. It's the current form in which I think most of us uh, study globally is what has been the Western uh, concept of it. So we've had education in different forms. It's just not in in the structured way that we have it and focus on the subjects in the way that we do. Um, just going a little uh, further on this, uh, Emmanuel, how do you think education differs maybe for uh, for women and, and and girls in, you know, Africa? I know it's, it's a wide continent with a lot of different countries, different cultural influences as well. Uh, but is there any common thread that you see that impacts women's education? The issue around gender and uh, gender in education is on the worldwide level is kind of similar. You know, if you consider centuries back uh, in Europe, uh, you wouldn't really find women uh, primarily in getting education because the idea was the woman's place in the house uh, to take care of the house, the man, where the man is responsible for becoming the economic powerhouse for the nation, for his family, for example, for the nation as a well. whole. Uh, but the idea quickly changed uh, leading to the last few uh, centuries where we saw women in education uh, and then more, more importantly in the last century uh, where women were moving to the workforce we made necessary for education. But the idea, like almost everything, kind of lagged behind in catching up in Africa. So, uh, well, 
largely due to uh, strong beliefs in uh, developed woman society, uh, is to mother a child, to take up the house, uh, you know, that necessary skill of a woman uh, that is naturally inherent in them. So you kind of didn't have a lot of female education or going to schools. Uh, if a man had five children, five sons and five daughters, he paid, he'd fund the studies for all five sons, even if the youngest uh, are still sons, than to fund education for their daughters because thought of more preparing the daughter for uh, marriage, you know, or taking care of the house in the future when she gets married. But fortunately, uh, this is not the case now um, because we've had uh, huge reforms in our education systems, promoting access to education for uh, especially females and then affirmative action in a lot of instances in terms of criteria for admitting students to school. So there's huge progress that have been made with that in gender and it's almost reversed now. Uh, we have more 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 uh, more girls in schools than guys now. Uh, so I think uh this the, the the skills of the balance are really tipping you know, in terms of female the a few girls in schools to more of a few a few uh, more, more a few guys in schools. So uh, that's that's the current situation. Or at least it isn't like uh, uh girls are not getting access to school now. Now the access is there, anybody literally uh, can go to school except uh issues that could affect both uh, boys and girls maybe I uh, lack of finance not necessarily then because they're girls so they can get it I find it really interesting yeah discussing that how there has been that uh, turnaround and like you said for, for centuries even in the west until very recently really there was that huge uh, inequality between for females having access to, to quality education it has been you know still very very recent so it, it is interesting that there's been that uh, change in Africa too very uh, very recently I remember, I think it was a quote from David Attenborough based on looking at the you know, climate change and the sort of impact or that one of the huge issues uh, in the world is obviously overpopulation. And one of the, uh, I think he was quoting some uh, scientific uh, studies, yeah, just looking at the ways in which um, when uh, young women are uh, given better access to education, there's a less of an inclination to uh, have uh, either have children or have a lot of children. So where there are poorer areas where there is lack of education for, for women, there's um, usually the expectation of having you know, large families, a lot of children, and then there's a lot of burden and a lot of, you know, in some cases, these are uh, areas which, you know, there's a lot of poverty as well. But um, where within the developing nations and uh, in wealthier countries as well, alike where there is that tendency to, if they are having children, to not have as many, and maybe when they when they feel they uh, at, at a later stage of life or whatever, that that has obviously had a big impact on the climate as well in terms of uh, you know reducing the overpopulation, which we do need to sort of mitigate somehow. And I think that there, there seems to be that trend that uh, higher education can there, there is a trend showing that yeah higher education for women can can enable that sort of population uh, de degrowth. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. And I think one of the uh, aspects, for example, in Rwanda, I think after the conflict, it was predominantly women who had to kind of forced into the workforce almost to to build the economy. And I think that really pushed also training and education and made it pretty much extremely simple for future generations to follow it as a template. So I, I think that sometimes it is certain circumstances that that push those changes because education again is one aspect and then your participation in the workforce is not always kind of in correlation to that. So I did find that like the most, I think a very interesting case um, of, of how that's, uh, you know, taken. Um, going forward, uh, I'm wondering how the higher education system uh, kind of works in the African context. And by that, I mean access to uh, universities, uh, people who do masters and more higher skills. How do you look at that, Emmanuel? And what kind of courses or scope of studies do you usually see that? So the higher education space in Africa, well, still needs a lot of development. You compare the degree, you try to look at a global acceptance or global quality of degrees across all, all continents or across all countries, and then you find that some well, Western degree, uh, Western institutions will place uh, uh, the rating system of a particular degree from a country uh, lower. Uh, you have to take additional 
cost units in which you, if you have any degree for a particular country due to some issues that may be valid or invalid sometimes. But it only comes back to point that there are certain uh, gaps that need to be solved. For instance, in the grades in science, uh, they are the lack because of lack of the uh, practicality of the courses or lack of the practice or as an experience of the courses. Uh, it really makes uh, the ability of the, uh, the scientists to deliver on some on some quotas very difficult. If you're taking a, a, a medical degree, you can't really do it in uh, uh, exactly in the classroom all the time. You will have to, uh, you will have some uh, uh, medical experience with whatever uh, areas of uh, areas that you're trying to become an expert in, whether in chemistry or uh, that. You don't really see that uh, 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 at least compared to the current uh, Western standards now. Uh, the standards in Africa are very low. And the same with engineering degrees. That is why we don't really see a uh, huge production coming from Africa. Uh, we kind of stick to more of the theoretical aspect of the cause of the program. And so that can really do very well. You kind know, of understanding how to uh, work, memorizing how things work. But as to the real experience of building things, putting ideas together, when in the basis for university, there, there is still a lot of nugget but lacking in that aspect. That's the primary difference in the education system in Africa and that of the uh, developed countries. I find it interesting, yeah. As, as you mentioned, I think when you look at the, um, within a Western context in higher education, I think there's been probably a number of issues like highlighted by uh, different people in recent years. Um, I remember one, uh, one medical doctor, a surgeon, um, I, can't, I have to find the uh, citation for it, but it was just mentioning that a lot of, say, medical practitioners there learning materials which are up to a couple of decades sort of out of date but that's the way in which obviously knowledge is disseminated but unless it's the pioneering aspect of a particular discipline that that the what is filtered down to those who obviously learn learn those um disciplines same within medicine there's things can be you know out of date and it's not necessarily um you know that, that these are practical aspects of education uh whether, whether it's that or, or something else one within the um Obviously, we have the natural sciences and other, you know, the hard sciences, et cetera. But in some contexts of professional disciplines, I think, you know, that, that can be an issue. And then, of course, we have uh, the more theoretical approaches, um, some of the soft sciences and social sciences. And there's been a lot of commentary in recent years about some of the um, issues within that in the West and the kind of like a, a epistemological uh, approaches there and some of the, let's say, the almost the political type of interferences of different approaches and um yeah so that that can act as a bit of a, a backdrop which can inhibit sort of educational capacity within certain areas like i think uh, particularly when you look at some of the soft sciences uh, to do with even areas like uh, social work or gender studies or, or cultural studies etc there can be quite a lot of uh not to academically rigorous approaches but also on the other side of that there can be um, responses to that which are quite backward as well. So I think it's really important that um, education systems or higher education has that sort of academic rigour both in the, as, as, as is the case obviously within the hard sciences, but also in areas like, uh, uh, you know, the, the natural sciences and medicine within journals, et cetera, as well, but also in the social sciences and the soft sciences because that's where that, you know, <laughs> more lacking academic um, rigour can be gotten away with to a greater extent because, uh, you know, outside of the hard sciences, which are based in, you know, mathematics and so forth, I, I still think, yeah, it's really important that institutions have a, a significant amount of um, academic uh, rigour and, and integrity because it's going to create a more thrivable society. Yeah, I agree. And I wonder, uh, given the cases you mentioned, that some of them remain outdated as to what you're studying, like it, it matters what who your teachers are, how further they're taking those subjects and making more practical for that you're teaching for. So I wonder how how is the environment for for teachers, especially at universities, in terms of their access to more academical information, more training uh, on their own end, and you know, pursuit of uh, excellence in their area of, of work. How, how do we see the quality of teachers itself today? 
if I could just briefly mention before Emmanuel, I'd be interested to hear about the African context. But yeah, I think within the West, again, that's been something highlighted that uh, there's often in many cases been not a lot, lot of uh, staff um, uh, job security as well for, for, for many academics, a lot of uh, tutors and lecturers. And there's sort of been a, uh, well, some would suggest in some ways a more of a corporatized or money interested approach when it comes to uh, you know, academic learning in general. So obviously I think there would be some impacts therefore on uh, lecturers and EO you know, teachers themselves. And then even when you look at say uh, primary school and high school, there are obviously um, in some cases, um, you can hear of many issues where uh, there's more of a, let's say a stranglehold on what can be uh, taught in a more sort of uh, expansive way for, you know, to expand people's minds or young people's minds. but yeah, it's perhaps not as uh, effective as that could be. So I, I would be interested to hear yeah, the African context uh, from Emmanuel. Yeah, um, the, well, the issue about well, the state of teachers in, the, in higher education or in education in Africa, I think uh, the, it is a cycle again that comes to uh, lack of funding. I think lack of funding is a major issue in education all over the world, even for developed countries. But I think it's worse here because uh, the child is not, just motivation should really come from uh, himself. And it's very hard to convince that motivated person that has some own personal issues that would be willing to go out of his way. When it's right, you find them so you know, outdated material. And then, as much as you want to blame that kind of system itself, or right? uh, we're in a world of uh, it took, uh, information error where reference information shouldn't really be difficult. But also, maybe it shouldn't you know, maybe, uh, be a part of the issue because they probably are not pushing their teachers to go. Remember, or provided them the material and uh, fresh information because you can easily have access to the information that you can to provide it. So you kind of put yourself in stores. So, hey, what about this? What about that? Now, you know, what do you think about this? I mean, if the teacher and the student himself and that's himself uh, uh, to a particular extent, then maybe teachers can catch up with that. But the lack of funding makes it hard for uh, teachers to really get the motivation and don't really. Uh, support that they need to uh, revamp their skills. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, and going forward on that, what do we think are the different solutions that, you know, uh, as individuals, as students, or teachers, or just society, you know, we could do to take this further? For example, I would probably suggest, uh, especially students looking into broader universities, now that we have internet, there are access to e-learning sources that help you understand things from a broader context and give you access to learn, you know, in other places. Uh, what, what do both of you think are different solutions we could look for? Yeah, I think probably the main point would be, yeah, for students or young adults at university, not just to listen to lecturers or their teachers, but to have an innovative, proactive approach to education themselves and just not to be limited by any sort of uh, pedagogical or epistemological approaches by the institution, but to sort of be proactive and in, in their own learning. Yeah, I, I also, I, as much as I agree with the other point that you said, uh, I believe that... Uh, there is a lot of, you know, we complain about lack of funding, uh, but there's a lot more that the uh, 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 state institutions can do, you know, because even at the basic level, it is surprised the, the state of uh, learning conditions that some students are in, you know, and then uh, it makes it very hard for a student to get that motivation to apply themselves. Some of them have no choice to, you know, be uh, uh, displaying that class that behaviors in the classroom. But uh, uh, we can certainly have a change of opinions and then uh, focus our research on education. Well, it is probably to be the best way uh, to innovate our existing system so that improve the human resource that we currently have, improving economic, uh, economic conditions and the standards of labor. When you empower an individual, you empower, you better empower well, several individuals that are dependent on that individual. So the state could certainly do more in appropriate terms of to education. Thank you so much, Emmanuel and Michael, for having this discussion. Thank you, Kavya. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you, guys. Always a pleasure to be here. Keep on thriving. <laughs>